on this episode of Old Joe's Reminiscence. Filming a second pilot had successfully sold Star Trek to NBC back in 1965, so... When the CBS Television Network chose to order their Planet of the Apes series instead of Gene Roddenberry's similar Genesis 2, he was left holding about 20 storylines that he had lined up. He favored one of those, an idea he'd originally come up with to sell Star Trek years earlier. After another bit of rewrite, Gene took his idea across town to ABC. The network was always looking for material to fill their movie of the week schedule. And Gene's project could likely be done on a shoestring. They could reuse footage and sets that they'd kept in anticipation of a series run. The ABC execs gave the go-ahead, but they said they wanted more action. Now where had Gene heard that before? I can't determine if recasting Dylan Hunt was the network's idea, or Gene's, or if Alex Cord simply wasn't available. Either way, they made several casting changes. Harper Smythe was recast and moved up in the billing, for example. Majel Barrett was back, of course, this time as the Yulof character, originally played by Titos Vandis. There was no need for both characters, as demonstrated by one of Majel's lines being given to Yulof in the final shoot of Genesis 2. Gene brought back Trek's Bill Tice as his costume designer, and Mark Daniels, who worked 15 episodes of Star Trek, was on board to direct. With Robert H. Justman producing, it was almost like filming another Star Trek episode. Before I get into details, I'd suggest you view it if you want to avoid spoilers. And now, let's travel back to ABC's Tuesday Movie of the Week presentation of Planet Earth. The film opens with stock footage of wildlife, similar to what had been used in Genesis 2. They aren't refilming the whole story, just doing a voiceover narration to recap and picking up from a later time. I can imagine that some indigenous wildlife could have survived to repopulate the earth, but Ted Cassidy walking a pride of lions along the outskirts of Albuquerque? they must have taken a wrong turn somewhere. We meet the new Dylan Hunt, now being played by John Saxon. John Saxon was born Carmine Orico in Brooklyn, New York on August 5, 1936. As a teen, he was coming out of a movie theater when a modeling agent spotted him. Then a talent scout saw his picture in a magazine and took him to Hollywood. He started appearing on the big screen at the age of 18 in 1954. His career included more than 200 film and television appearances until 2017. John Saxon died on July 25, 2020. Pax is no longer deep inside a mountain. The Genesis 2 matte painting for Tyrania now serves as a distant view of Pax City, while the University of California, Irvine, is the location of the exterior shots. The people are different, too, and not just the cast. There are no more unisex jumpers and Mo Howard cookie-cutter haircuts on both the men and women. When they're not in form-fitting uniform jumpsuits, the women wear elegant flowing robes. Many men are dressed like present-day service techs. 
I dislike the color of the science team's uniforms. They fit pretty well. They just look really, really bad. The sub-shuttle station is brighter, and the shuttle simulation seems to run a bit faster. They reused the footage of the sub-shuttle moving underground, but they added a neat title graphic. We start out with Dylan recording an after-action report. It's kind of like a Star Trek captain's log. He says that Kriegs recognized them. Well, duh. If they weren't wearing those awful puke green uniforms, they might not have been noticed. I'll say one thing about the uniforms, though. They sure accentuate Harper Smythe's figure. There's no need to ask if there's a girl under there in this film. I have to add that I'm not too keen on the Krieg's purple uniforms either. I was barely three minutes in, though, before I realized that, other than a few of the updates, I'm not quite as fond of this film, script-wise. I don't remember a whole lot about it either. I've only seen Planet Earth a few times, and the last time I tuned in late... Then I had to leave for work before it ended. It took a great deal of suspension of disbelief to accept a mid-20th century truck was still running in 2133. And what are they using for fuel? Rhea Tasco steps into Percy Rodriguez's shoes as Primus, now Pater, Kimbridge. Why in the new world did they bring this old man, the head of Pax no less, into this dangerous territory? He goes down, and the others have to distract the Krieg to allow him to get away. Now, for some reason, their standard tranquilizer darts, the ones that can knock out a human in less than a second, they don't seem to work at all on these Krieg mutants. The Krieg throw a net over Harper Smythe, now being played by Janet Margolin. Janet Margolin was born in New York City on July 25, 1943. Drawn to performing early on, she attended the New York High School of Performing Arts. Starting out as a prop girl, Janet quickly progressed to performing on stage, making her Broadway debut at age 18. Film director Frank Perry noticed her and took the Tony-nominated teen to Hollywood to put her in a movie. She was only 19 when she appeared with Keir Dole in the 1962 film David and Lisa. When film offers became scarce, Janet would take the odd television role. Her last theatrical film appearance was as a prosecutor in the 1989 sequel, Ghostbusters 2. She made three more television appearances before she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Janet Margolin died on December 17, 1993 at the age of 50. The Krieg have rifles, but they don't use them. I'm guessing they want to take these humans alive. Dylan and one of the Krieg duke it out. Dylan wins, of course, and it looks as if Dylan wants to kill the Krieg soldier. Dylan, don't! The team escapes, squeezing through an old ventilator shaft, but not before one of the Krieg shoots. Pater Kimbridge in the back. Ted Cassidy returns as warrior Isaiah, and he has one of the Krieg's guns. It appears that he's going to use it until he smashes it against a rock wall. All PAX members have taken a no-kill oath. As Isaiah carries Pater Kimbridge to the sub-shuttle, we see blood on the front of the man's tunic, indicating a through-and-through -through wound. And that's bad. They call ahead to Majel so she'll know to have a medical team waiting. She also shuts off power to the sub-shuttle terminal in Krieg territory. I noticed Tex working at a computer panel in the background. They've advanced quite a bit since we last saw Pax. I can imagine Kirk and Spock playing this next scene, which makes it obvious that this script was adapted from a Star Trek pitch idea. And with your mind, try. 
Dylan urges Baylock to perform something that looks almost exactly like Spock's Vulcan mind meld. I also think Roddenberry was obsessed with ESP, as it also plays a big part of the second Star Trek pilot. Baylock is played by Christopher Carey. Christopher Carey was born Christopher Bay Carey's foot on June 16, 1934 in England. He performed on stage in England before moving to Hollywood in 1955. He appeared in a few films, but television was his bread and butter. In addition to acting, he also tried his hand at writing and directing. His last role was a voiceover in 2000, shortly before his death on April 1st of that year. Whatever he tried, it didn't work. Kimbridge is slipping away. He's dying. Isaiah pulls out a necklace and starts a prayer ritual. Isaiah, please. I let the savage pray. It'll help as much as anything I can do here. In another update, the PAX medical team has a more modern medical cart with a built-in life support. Concluding long report. If Cambridge dies, the responsibility is mine. And our return to PAX has made this burden no easier. To me, Cambridge is PAX. That concludes Dylan's recording, bringing us up to the present day. Harper Smythe calls to him. The team needs to track down a surgeon who'd gone missing. He went exploring in an area that Lyra Ah had told Dylan to avoid, where women treat men as pets. And again, why is a surgeon, in fact both of their most capable surgeons, out in the field? Dylan has a plan. As we open Act 2, we see men pulling a plow. I find this very odd, considering that horses do seem to be plentiful here. Guest star and Gene Roddenberry favorite, Diana Muldor, rides in and demands a fresh team. I want this field ready tomorrow. Diana Muldor was born on August 19, 1938 in Brooklyn, New York. She started out acting in school plays. Diana graduated from Sweet Briar College in 1960. She spent some time on Broadway, but did make her way to Hollywood. She kept busy, playing in a lot of television series starting in the 1960s. She was the president of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences between 1984 and 1985. Diana Muldor's last acting credit was an appearance in 1992 and she did some voice work in 1993. She needs that field plowed and ready for planting by tomorrow. Dylan and Harper Smythe should have done more research. Dylan doesn't know that submissive males are to keep their eyes down, and he gets whipped for his indiscretion. But maybe he's into that sort of thing. Diana Muldor's character challenges Harper Smythe for ownership of Dylan. He is my property. He was your property. Now what? When Dylan attempts to ask about Jonathan Connor, Muldor explains the rule of silence. I've explained to you the rule here is silence. In this exposition scene, we find out that she feels it's easier to train dinks than horses. We don't geld our males, if that's what worries you. She intends to sell Dylan at the marketplace. Meanwhile, Harper Smythe is walking. I'm guessing her horse ran off. 
When Dylan is turned over to be trained and sold, he tries to talk to the women. In my opinion, they're way too lenient with him. Even if he is an outsider, he's still a dink. One question. Then I'll obey all your rules. I thought Mark said he had no spirit. The one with the looped pigtails is Bronta. She's played by Corinne Camacho, who appeared in dozens of television roles. She played Dr. Bartlett on 18 episodes of Medical Center. Villar, the one with Princess Leia earmuffs, is played by Joanna De Winter. Of her scores of roles, she's probably best known for portraying Dr. Maggie Lawrence in the All in the Family spinoff, Gloria. Why would they even bother listening to Dylan at this point? He asks about the man named Jonathan Connor once again. I have a friend who disappeared in this area about a year ago. If he's alive and he's here, I must find him. When Dylan tries to ask the dinks, he gets the same reaction that Alex Cord had gotten when he'd ventured out at night in Terranian compound. I'm looking for some oh. type of... I have to find it outside of... Then Dylan spies his comrades, Isaiah and Balok. It seems that they too were captured, but I'm wondering how they ended up here before Dylan as they were going farther on that sub shuttle than he did. Also, they must have been there for quite a while since they're already trained to a point of absolute submission. Well, how did you get here? This seems absolutely absurd to me. Especially when we think about how big and strong Isaiah is. How did those few women even try to capture that savage? They take Isaiah away to be auctioned off. Stamina in his cause as you like. He's a bargain in strength and stamina. Look at these shoulders. Look at these butt muscles. Either they have one hell of a training program, or Isaiah is going along with it for some reason. Several women haggle over the giant. Delba is played by Claire Brennan. She made a few dozen appearances beginning in 1960 until her death at the age of 43 in 1977. Thetis is played by then 26-year-old Sarah Chatton, who also went by Sue Rainford, and Sue Dahlman in her half dozen roles. After a long absence from the screen, she appeared as older Olivia in the 2016 film Indignation. While the women are ooing and aahing over Isaiah, Dylan tries to talk to Balak. It's your friend, Dylan. You're an esper. Shut out all of this. He eventually gets through to the doctor, who reasons that there must be something in the food. All Dylan needs to do is go without eating, but how long can he do that? Bidding concludes for Isaiah. Since they came in together, they want to sell Isaiah and Balak together. None of the women are interested in him, but one of them notices Dylan. How about that one instead? The Outsider? That's prime breeder stock if I manage Yes, I like him. Dylan is to be sold as breeder stock the next day, after his training. The women are concerned that the training might affect him. They want him tested. In Act 3, Harper Smythe approaches a house. When she comes in to ask directions, she's told to go away. She fights Treese, the woman of the house, played by Sally Kemp, who appeared in dozens of shows, including 16 episodes of Dynasty and 21 episodes of Days of Our Lives. Meanwhile, Dylan is untied and told to eat. This is one scene that I truly remember because it's so stupid. Swapping bowls, I get, but why does he keep talking? Eat. Eat. Back 
Back at the house, Trace gives Harper Smythe a lesson on the natural order of a female-dominated society. She's going to have to fight Diana Muldor's character, Marg, for possession of Dylan. Meanwhile, the Krieg, with their Klingon-esque ridges, are planning a strike against the women. Position units. One to attack each female household. They're males. They will not fight. No. The Krieg commander is one of more than 100 television appearances by John Quaid. Busy character actor Raymond Sutton appears as the Krieg captain. Back at the compound, Dylan finds it quite easy to escape that holding pen. and you're going to help me find my friend. Well, that didn't go as planned. We cut back to Teresa's house. Harper Smythe tries on a new dress, and they discuss the dink extract. In the beginning, it was given only to troublesome males. But over the years, our women have begun to depend on it. It's in a gruel that Marg delivers every day to most of the other households. Which makes it impossible for anyone to learn Marg's formula. Back to the compound, Marg wonders if Dylan might have tricked Villar. Are you certain you saw him eat the gruel? How long have I been running this compound, Marg? Do you think I can be tricked? He tricked me, Villar. I didn't think he had any spirit. This is when I first noticed that Marg's outfit quite prominently accents Diana Muldor's navel. Way to stick it to the censors, Jean. And when she reaches for her dagger, we get a naval close-up. What's this? It's the old secret compartment in the dagger handle trick, eh? Marg pours a vial of her secret dink potion straight into Dylan's mouth, and it starts to take effect right away. He begs her not to hurt him. Please, don't hurt me. Hurt you, little man. I have more interesting things in mind for you. In Act 4, we join Dylan back in the compound. He's still fighting the drug's effects. He's the next one coming up for auction. Harper Smythe rides up with her new friend Trace, and she challenges Marg. That dink is my property. I captured him and brought him to the Confederacy. I challenge any claim you have on him. Marg jumps Harper Smythe from behind. She's used to this sort of thing. Her stunt double tosses Janet Margolin's stunt double around like a rag doll. But it's not all stunt doubles as the actors get a little action in, too. The tables eventually turn and Harper Smythe gets the advantage, taking Marg down. Since Harper Smythe isn't interested in selling Dylan, those other women had made that trip for nothing. Treese puts forth the idea that it's unnecessary to drug men to control them. Harper Smythe inquires after the other outsider, Jonathan Connor. He was a medical healer in my country, about 34 years old, brown hair, hazel eyes, intelligent features. Since Marg owns most of the outsiders, she offers to let Harper Smythe look over her stock. Once she's alone, Harper Smythe contacts Pax. Pater Kimbridge is in critical condition. She tries to help Dylan in his fight against the effects of the drug. She seems to think that he'll be less frightened of her if she seduces him. It's just starting to get interesting when Jonathan walks in. He's not drugged. He's created an antidote to the drug. Cool. But how are they going to get him away from Marg?
When we open the next act, Jonathan Connor is administering his antidote to Dylan. You're Dr. Connor. Yes, it's Jonathan. You've been drugged. They devise a plan for Harper Smythe to trade Dylan for the doctor. Could we make an exchange? Mine's extremely well trained. But you are my guest, so I agree. You're very generous, Mark. Thank you. You think he'll be all right? Mark can be dangerous. It probably depends on how well he understands female psychology. I don't think he knows the first thing about it. Dylan is eyeing up the ham and veggies that Marg is chowing down on. Remember, he hasn't eaten for quite a while. Get up! How dare you sit with me! Dylan tells her a tale of having multiple wives. You might say it's a wives' tale. Or you might not. I always go for the dad joke. Gordo was played by surfing beefcake actor and artist Aaron Kincaid. He starts fumbling around. Gordo, you're being a nuisance. Get out! All of you, get out! Marg is intrigued, but she doubts that Dylan could be telling the truth. Then he gives her a cock and bull story about siring 41 children. Then, he really lays it on thick. The males in my country are trained from childhood in certain practices which make us different. And she's buying it. P.T. Barnum was right. They move their feast to the bedroom and she sends Gorda out for wine. While Dylan is chowing down and enjoying some wine, Mark sneaks up on him with a bullwhip. But he saw her shadow and he flinches, pretending to still be under the spell of that extract. I simply love Diana Muldor's outfit here. If only she'd let her hair down, it'd be perfect. The next scene of Dylan seducing Marg is hokey. I can't believe she'd actually let him get her drunk. Meanwhile, Dr. Connor is pouring his antidote into the gruel shipment. Back in Marg's bedroom, she's finally let her hair down. How nice. What did you call me? Pussycat. <laughs> Pussycat. <laughs> I think they're both drunk at this point. He starts calling himself Rip as in Rip Van Winkle. Rip blows out a candle, expecting... Well, I'm guessing he wasn't expecting her to be passed out so soon. In the final act, it's the next morning, and those militant mutants show up and start shooting up the place. I hadn't been expecting Dylan to spend the night with Marg, figuring he'd skedaddle during the night, but there he is. Dylan easily disarms one of them. but the rest have Marg's men rounded up. An old man who tries to run is shot in the back. Martha. Dylan, knowing that the antidote was in the gruel, tries to convince the men to fight back. The Krieg have other prisoners too, Dr. Connor and Harper Smythe. They put her on the ground and pull out a Dylan does a running kick. He fights with three of the Krieg soldiers while the Dinks stand there doing nothing. Fight! Fight! I'll kill you! 
I was beginning to wonder why the Krieg weren't using their rifles. When a Krieg does brandish a pistol, he's quickly disarmed. Dylan is still fighting three of them when Isaiah rides up on horseback. He tackles two of them and he does a quick Three Stooges move. After the fighting is over, the females from the other farms come by to say how their men have also stepped up the fight. Now, I get that we're saying that the women have taken feminism a bit too far, but it bugs me that they're suddenly helpless without the men's help, regardless that a woman, Juanita Bartlett, had helped write the teleplay. The same thing bugged me on search when women's lib proponent Gloria Harding went running into Hugh Lockwood's arms the minute they were shot at. Anyway, Peter Kimbridge is still in critical condition. Dr. Connor calls for two fast horses, but Dylan has a better idea. While Dylan and Isaiah drive the doctor to the sub shuttle, Harper Smythe stays behind. I was surprised when Dylan called Harper Smythe HS because that's how I'd been abbreviating her name while I was taking notes. The females agree to try running their households without their drug. They're afraid there will be chattering, making mischief. And children, perhaps? On their way back to get H.S., Dylan recounts to Isaiah how there used to be millions of cars all over the world. Isaiah doesn't look very comfortable. They get word that Dr. Connor has made it back in time and that Peter Kimbridge will be okay. In parting, Marg invites Dylan back to visit sometime. Maybe he'll end up being breeding stock after all. Harper Smythe is obviously jealous. Men, they have their place. Then they return to Pax to recount their tale to Pater Kimbridge. The final scene reminds me of the humorous banter on the Enterprise Bridge at the end of many of the Star Trek episodes. I bought the DVD to do this review. These Warner Archive Collection discs are a fairly good quality, but they're simply bare bones. Just the movie, nothing more. No narration, no extras. It was previously released on VHS tape. Check out these treatments from the clamshell packaging. It's almost as if whoever did the artwork had never even seen the movie. Of the two pilots, I think I prefer Genesis 2, even though it was a bit darker and Alex Cord wasn't as relatable as John Saxon. I'm sort of torn on the version of Harper Smythe I prefer. The one portrayed by Lynn Marta in Genesis 2 was sweet and innocent, whereas Janet Margolin was way more curvy. I still can't imagine why they would have taken their PAX leader on a mission into hostile territory, but I definitely prefer Percy Rodriguez in the role of Kimbridge. So this concludes my look at Planet Earth, the second pilot that's based on Gene Roddenberry's idea surrounding his character of Dylan Hunt as a man from the past. I understand that the next logical step after this would be Strange New Worlds, a 1975 ABC made-for-TV movie also starring John Saxon. Gene Roddenberry wasn't involved in that one at all. Although Dylan Hunt is not reused, John Saxon is. Much of the suspended animation idea is used, and I hear it's PAX in outer space. I don't recall whether or not I've seen it, but there's just something about it that tells me that I must have. Remember to like, subscribe, and comment. Activate the notification bell so you'll know when to join me on my next Old Joe's Reminiscence.